Hello, uh, good evening and welcome to our Bible webinar being broadcast live tonight on Thursday the 16th of July 2020. Uh, it's wonderful to see that we've got a number of people registered to join us this evening and I'm sure we're all going to find the next hour a very valuable insight into the importance of having faith during these worrying times. You may have seen when registering that this evening we're we'll going to be using the Bible to help us find answers to some important questions that many people have been asking, especially during these last few months, such as why do we suffer? Why doesn't God seemingly intervene? And what is the purpose of the coronavirus? And we're also going to find out how can the Bible help us now and how can the Bible give us hope for the future? And in a minute, I'll hand over to Matt Davies, who will be leading the webinar for us this evening. And if you have any questions that come to mind during the webinar, then can I draw your attention to the Q&A panel on your screen? If you can jot your questions down in there, and we'll do our best to try and address them this evening. If we receive a lot of questions or we run out of time, then don't worry. Uh, we'll be releasing an FAQ document in the next few days where we can respond in more detail to any of those questions that were asked. Please keep an eye on our website, uh, bibletruthnottingham.org.uk, and also our Facebook page for updates. Before I hand over to Matt, I thought I'd give you a bit of information about the Christadelphians who have organised this event. Uh, the Christadelphians in Nottingham are ordinary people from all walks of life. And the name Christadelphian means brothers and sisters in Christ. We're bound together by a common faith in the gospel preached by Jesus Christ and his apostles in the first century. And fundamental to our belief is the hope of resurrection to eternal life in God's coming kingdom on earth. And it's that hope that we want to share with you this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Matt to help us to use the Bible to think about faith in the time of Corona. Well, good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be with you in these strange and peculiar times. It's really odd to be speaking to you through a screen, through pixels, rather than face to face, as we would usually do in our hall down at Forest Road in Nottingham, um, where we, we've hold, held similar events to this. So um, I'm going to do my best to, to speak to you tonight in this really, really strange way. And really, it's my privilege to give you a perspective, give you a Christadelphian perspective, the community that I'm here to represent um, this evening, of faith in the time of Corona, to, to really look at kind of the events that we're facing ourselves with and to, to maybe give you um, a perspective, a few thoughts um, that maybe you hadn't considered uh, before. And of course, we are in really strange times, aren't we? We're on we're, we've been in lockdown. Some of us still are in lockdown. Um, the whole country has been, uh, been put into this really strange, paused state. I know it's starting to, to open up. We're having the big bounce back, as they're calling it, uh, begin. But for many of us, the last three or four months have been most peculiar. We've been stuck in our houses, haven't we? Unable to go out. And I think at one point, you know, it said that, uh, I think I read one report that said nearly over half of the world's population was in lockdown, was shut down. We're in unprecedented times, really strange, really peculiar things that we're facing. And, you know, it's so peculiar, in fact, I don't know if you got one of these, but 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 the president, um, no, the president, the prime minister himself, Boris Johnson, wrote to us all. I mean, how strange is that? And it was a, a really weird thing to receive a letter from 10 Downing Street. I don't know if you thought that was a bit peculiar to outline to us what was going on from the government's perspective. And we know that Boris Johnson himself has suffered from this coronavirus. And even some of the royal family, for example, Prince Charles, I think, has had it. So this is a real leveller. This is non-discriminatory, this virus. We are in this all together, all sort of aspects of society. And, um, and we're facing some really tragic things, aren't we? I mean, these are the, the figures from earlier this week. You know, over half a million people have died at the hands of this pandemic. And we're just seeing those graphs go up and up and up, aren't we? Which is, is very worrying, very concerning and, and very, very, um, you know, very humbling. We're also sort of seeing news articles which sort of talk about this. People are really considering the fact, coming face to face with the fact that we weren't we're not in control. We have a problem. We have this problem of, 
of mortality and death. And sometimes I think in the Western world, because we're so privileged, we, uh, we don't often think about this. But now we're having to cope with death awareness, as we read there in the Scientific American. And it's really playing on, on people's minds, which is one of the reasons, to be honest, we held, we're holding this webinar this evening. And not only the, the problem of the virus and the, the health consequences of it, but also with half the world in lockdown, we also have this problem with the economic crash which is coming. Um, and in fact, is here. Um, some people listening in, I'm sure, have been affected by, by this problem. Um, the Bank of England has said there, you see that article from Reuters in the middle of your screen, that this is uh, the worst slump in 300 years. And so we are really facing unprecedented times, real, a real problem. We're, we, if we could summarise, really, we're worried about getting ill and death, aren't we? People are worried about their families, and particularly elderly members. People are worried about their jobs and the economy. But this evening's sort of talk um, is really to give another perspective, um, not just a human perspective, but to represent the Bible. And really, if you think of nothing else after this evening, I mean, the, the, the key point, the essence of what we're going to be saying to you this evening is that God is in control, which is kind of comforting to know that, there, that God is in control. And we're, we're going to go through some principles around that in a minute. But it also throws up its own challenges. Because if there is a God and, and you know, we as Christadelphians believe there is, then we have to kind of really come face to face with the with the consequences of that because what that says is is that 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 there is a god and he is in control but there is this problem of human suffering there is this problem of death there is this problem of mortality and so what we want to examine as we advertised in in, in our various adverti adverti advertisements around this webinar is 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 we want to look at some of the key big questions like why do we suffer why doesn't God intervene in these things? Why doesn't he just kind of make it all nice for us? What is the purpose of the coronavirus? These are the things that we hope to explore um, as we go through. And they all uh, assume that there is a God. Um, we're not here this evening to, to make the case or to present the evidence uh, that points to the fact that it's, we believe it's quite reasonable and uh, that, that, to, to believe that there is a God. For example, we could have looked at, and we do from time to time, look at things like um, Bible prophecy, which predicts great swathes of human history before it's even happened. Or we could look at into the, the, the depths of nature to look at the hallmarks of design that we see there, which, which all point to the fact that, um, well, to, 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 to what we believe is a fact, that there is a God. Now, the key thing that, that, that I want to point out here is, is that as Christadelphians, we believe in the Bible and the Bible gives us a perspective. We believe it gives us God's perspective. You see, if there is a God, a great creator, an almighty being that, uh, that is supreme, then I believe it's quite logical for us to think, well, well what is his view on this? We can sit here as humans, and I think what a lot of people do, particularly um, our atheist friends, is they sit, they sit down and they, they look at things from a very human perspective. And they say, well, if there is a God, and then they pontificate around what they would do if they imagine there is a God. And so we often try and think almost like, if there is a God, I'd like God to make everything nice for me. I, almost some people think of God as, as if he should be almost like a benevolent sort of, Father Christmas figure going around giving out sweets. And because re the reality of life is, is not all comfy, therefore there can't be a God. Well, what we want to do today is, is to not just look at things from a human perspective or a humanist perspective. The Bible gives us another perspective. Into the conversation I should submit to you, we have to bring in God's perspective. And so we need to think about what that perspective is. So even if you reject that there's a God, what hopefully this evening will give to you is, is his perspective as outlined in the teachings of the Bible. The Bible does hold the answers. And so tonight we're going to take some time to look at them. Now, a few key principles that we want to look at. What does God, what, what does the Bible say about God? Lots of things, but, but consider some of these sort of basic things. The Bible says that God is supreme. 
So for example, here's a, some, some various passages. I'm going to give you a string of passages now, which really help to hopefully establish that for you. It says here in Psalm 24, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. In Chronicles, it says that all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine or God's. And in another Psalm, it says that our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. The Bible says that God created everything. The Bible says that God controls everything. The Bible says that God does whatever he pleases. Not one atom is out of line with his purpose. Here's some more. It says here in Job that whatever God's uh, soul desireth, even that he doeth. It says in Psalms that all God has to do is speak and it's done. And in another Psalm there, Psalm 103, it says the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. So the Bible teaches that God is supreme, that God is in control, that God rules. In fact, in Daniel, it says he rule the most high rules in the kingdom of men. It says in Isaiah that his hand is stretched out and who shall turn it back? Like no one can stop God once his mind is made up. And it says in Timothy that he is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and the Lord of lords who only hath immortality. So God is supreme. That's the teaching of the Bible. No one can stop him and he is in control. To sum that up, there's a passage in Isaiah where God says, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. That's that's what we were talking about around Bible prophecy. God declares things before they've even happened, the, the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God, the, the only potentate, the only ruler, the sole ruler of the universe is completely sovereign, is completely supreme and does all of his own pleasure. That's what the Bible says. So everything is under his control. Now, the Bible says something else about God. The Bible says that, that, that God is a God of truth, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. He keepeth truth. All his works are truth. He cannot lie. So the Bible tells us that this God who is supreme doesn't lie to us. He values truth. And the Bible tells us that this truth can only be found in one place, and that is the place of the Bible, the place of the Holy Scriptures. And this is the word of truth, the word of God, we read in Thessalonians, of truth in Timothy, in Colossians, the truth of the gospel. The gospel means the good news. This, this Bible that we have, it contains a message of good news. It's the word of truth, it says in James, the scripture of truth in Daniel. God's word is truth, we read in John, and the word of the truth of the gospel. So the Bible really lays something down to us, unlike man stuff, which is debatable, is untrue in most parts. Man doesn't really know. Scientists don't really know how things happen. They were not there. The Bible, in contrast, says, no, this is certain. This is true. This is God's will. This is God's uh, message and we can find out about it in the scriptures. So just to recap then, just what we were saying. Uh, by the way, I've, I've got these kind of recap slides every now and again as we go through. So if you get lost, don't worry, we're going to come to some of these slides and you'll be able to, to hopefully uh, uh, catch up if I've not explained things very well. But what we're saying here in these key principles is that God is supreme, that God is the source of truth, and the Bible is how we access truth. That's what we, we find when we open the pages of the Bible. In other words, if you want to understand another perspective outside of the human condition, you need to open your Bible to find God's will, to find God's truth. Now, of course, this all presents quite a big challenge to the believer in God, because what this says then is if God is completely supreme and in control, then we have to accept that this coronavirus and all the horrors that come with it are under his sovereign control. How then do we understand this suffering? How then do we understand this problem that mankind has with the coronavirus, with death 
and with the things that we suffer as a race? Well, that's our first question then. Why does God allow suffering? Now, to kind of understand that, we really need to to come face to face with a few things. You see, the Bible tells us that we have a problem. Mankind has an issue. Here's an example in Timothy. It says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So the Bible says we need saving. That's the message of the Bible. Like the, the message of the Bible is one of hope, is one of positivity. And we'll come on to that a bit later, that we can be saved and that God in his love and mercy has offered a way out of the problem that we're in. But what does this mean to save sinners? Now, we have to go to the Bible to answer that question. We need to establish what this problem is. We need saving. It says there as sinners. What's sin? Well, it's the transgression of God's law. So there's this problem of sin that we need to be saved from. What's all that about? How did how did this problem start? Well, I'm sure you know the story of, of the fall, as we call it, the Genesis account. The Bible says that, that really everything started in the Garden of Eden with the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. And the Bible explains to us that these uh, people were commanded not to eat of a particular fruit, of a particular tree. And if they did, the consequence of them eating of that fruit would be death. And um, I'm sure you know the story that that um, that actually they, they do eventually eat of it. And there is this first sin that takes place. We call it the fall. And um, in Genesis 3, we read about the consequences of... Of that, um, of that sin. And as God had said, um, death was now going to be part of the human condition. Adam was to be subject to death in Genesis 3 verse 19. In fact, it says in Romans 6 verse 23 in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. And so we find that, 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 that a change took place upon the human condition. Adam and Eve became mortal. They became dying creatures. And eventually they had offspring and so on, but eventually they died. We know also that um, that the Bible says Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden. They had no access back to, to God, as it were, in that the old way that they did. And there was kind of like this barrier between God and man. There was these, these major problems. The Bible tells us that, that they had this kind of um, mortality that was brought in and, and uh, the, the suffering of that. The Bible also tells us that there was this moral problem that came in with sin and this kind of bias to, to go against God's ways. And I'll, I'll pick up on that in a minute. But, but to sort of simplify that, what we're saying here is that, that, that this, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of a visual person, so I like to see things in a, in a little diagram. So hopefully this explains uh, things for you uh, really simply but in the beginning we've got like God and a man together there um, as it were obviously God was always higher the supreme being but um, but when Adam sinned then Adam fell from grace as it were fell down from being with God and so there was this problem man descended into a state of sin and death now we read all about the consequences of the fall, all through scripture and the condition that man finds himself in. This is what the Bible teaches. Unlike kind of the the, the society outside, the Western society we live in, which teaches us that mainly mankind is good, the Bible gives us a very different perspective. The Bible tells us that our hearts and the thoughts of our hearts are evil. The Bible tells us that our heart is deceitful or sick. And the Bible tells us that out of our hearts, out of our reasoning, proceed evil thoughts. And so not only do we have the problem of mortality, but we have this problem of, 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 that we've inherited from Adam of also being at variance in the way that we think in regards to God's ways. So much so that, that we read in the Bible that, that the Bible teaches us that in us, in our flesh, in our being... There is no good thing in the eyes of God, like naturally speaking. We're not naturally good. We have a problem. 
Um, we read in Romans that, that um, this is the Apostle Paul through inspiration speaking. He says, now then, there is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He found this, this propensity in his, in his system that made him do bad things, do things at variance against God's ways, almost naturally. We read of that in James, how it works. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So we find that mankind is in this state of, of, of sin and death, a state related to sin and so rightly related to death, a mortal position. And um, it says here, doesn't it, in Romans 5, I don't know if you've read this before, but it makes it really, really clear because it says, Wherefore, as by one man, that was Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so when Adam failed to obey God, the consequences of that have been experienced by all his offspring that came after him. Uh, they experience two things. They're subject to death, mortal. They're going to die. They decay. In fact, when man is first born, as it were, it's, he, he, he's, ready, he, he's able to die, isn't he? And he almost is on the way to death. Not only that, though, this mortal problem of the, of the, of the mortal, fragile nature of man, but also there's this temptation to sin, which is often referred to in the Bible as the carnal mind or the flesh. And so... Like DNA, as it were, these things spread through humanity. It was man's responsibility. Notice here, by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. Because at that time, Adam and Eve were humanity. They represented humanity. God had said, don't do this. And they did it. And so the consequences of that had to be felt by us, by humanity. And it's just unfortunate that that's the way it is. But that is... The way it is, that's what the Bible teaches us, that we are of the same mortal nature that we inherit from Adam. We have the same constitution as him in this fallen state, in this problem that we have. We are subject to death and we have these temptations to sin and we inherit these. And as each generation passes, they, they, have, they, they pass on this problem, this misfortune in where we are. We're all sinners then. We're all connected to that. Now, there are other consequences to the fall because man, um, I don't know if, you, you, if you've read the Genesis account. If you do read it afterwards, you'll find that, that certain things happen to nature. There's thorns and thistles, as it were, that seem to appear in the sweat of man's face would he eat bread. And um, the, we call it the curse, like the, the, the natural world around man became became fallen, became cursed. Cursed be the ground, it says. And so there was a change in the creation. That's what the Bible is telling us. And we read that as part of that, the nature of the world is, is in a state of decay and death is present everywhere. So we find that there's things like we read of, for example, in the Bible of, of famines and pestilences and earthquakes that are brought to bear, that, are, that, are, that we have to deal with. Um, Pestilences are like viruses, the, the, the problems that we've, that we've got today with coronavirus. This is all part of the fallen world, the state of the world that we live in. And they're there mentioned uh, pestilences and famines and, and various other things. God spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. So we face these things. The planet we live on today, my dear friends, is a dangerous place to live, isn't it? We've got volcanoes and tidal waves and we've got these these bacterias that are causing all these problems, we are part of a fallen creation. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 22, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And so the world is fallen, this globe that we inhabit, and man is fallen on it as well. We're all, we're all in this fallen state. And so we have these problems that we that we have to face up to and as a part of that this this problem of 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 disease and pestilence is very much part and parcel 
of that fallen state. And, you know, I think sometimes we have to be very careful not to be sensationalist. You know, we are facing unprecedented times within our lifetime. But but when you look back through history, you find that, that pandemics have um, have been part of the human condition way back right into antiquity. You know, I've not put them on the screen, but there's there's evidence of them going right, right back into the classical era. But but in more recent times, we've had the Black Death, where it's estimated between 75 to 200 million people died. The Spanish flu, the Asian flu, the swine flu, Ebola, terrible things that have always inflicted themselves upon mankind. Indeed, the world we live is a very dangerous place to live. And then and I know, I'm sure like, like, like me, you, you are, will be really grateful that in effect we live on this side of history. Because it's, I believe it's only up until 1885 or thereabouts that scientists discovered that they could cure disease. Before that, there was no hope at all. If you, if you got a disease, you, you were pretty much dead. So we are blessed to live um, in an era where, where mankind have discovered the secrets of these things and can uh, create ways around them. But the truth of the matter is, is these are real problems for humanity. This problem of mortality, this problem of sin and death, and the pandemics that that's all part of. Now, I think it's probably worth saying here that that God actually is supreme, as we've pointed out, and therefore this is all part and parcel of his sovereign control. Now, remember I said to you at the start, um, when we looked at those passages in Genesis, that God had said as a consequence for sin, um, mankind would would die, would become related to death. And that that's right and true, and that, that's what happened. And so we find ourselves in this place, but the Bible doesn't shy away from the fact that God is in control, like he has a purpose for evil. He uses it even. He wills it to exist. He doesn't hide it. The Bible, I think sometimes liberalists, they try and, they try and you know, dig dog, God out of this hole of, as it were, being in c- complete control. But in so doing, actually, then they limit the power of God. The Bible doesn't limit the power of God. The Bible fronts it very clearly. And I think we need to front it in this talk today. You see here in Deuteronomy, it says, God says, I kill and make alive. Um, in Exodus, it talks about God making people dumb and deaf and people blind. In, uh, in Samuel, it says, God killeth. He maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave, and he bringeth up. So we can't kind of um, adopt a liberal ideology that uh, that tries to paint God, as we've said, as this kind of Father Christmas figure that's trying to make everything nice and rosy for us. We we like to sometimes, I think, create God in our own image. Like, how would we like life to be? And um, and when you know when when kind of people think like that. The reality is obviously very different, but the Bible never presents God like that. That's a very humanist, human way of looking at things. The Bible presents God as being completely supreme and sovereign. It says here, you know, shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it, like an evil circumstance, like God is in control. It says there that God creates evil in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, I will bring evil upon all flesh. So God here is taking responsibility of evil circumstances, not moral evil or sin, but, but uh, evil, that, that's kind of man's fault, right? If somebody is, is uh, morally evil, this is talking about evil circumstances. God permits those circumstances to, to be re- a reality. And he sometimes even causes them evil circumstances for his purpose because he's God. He's in control of everything and he doesn't hide away from that. You can't have it both ways, can you? You can't have a supreme God who's in complete control, and then say, but he doesn't control that that bit. Either God exists and is supreme and is in control, or he does not. And so we cannot deny the power of God um, as Christadelphians. We cannot reinvent God. We cannot diminish his power. We cannot limit it. So just to kind of sort of recap there, what are we saying there? Well, what we're saying is, is that that really this is a problem with mankind, because after the fall, um, mankind was sinful and mortal. And that is a consequence of that, as a consequence of the fall, decay, decay and death entered into the world. And that God allows 
and wills suffering to take place because of his righteousness. Let me just explain that very briefly. God is right. That's the message of the Bible. So God said, if you do this, there's a consequence. If God then would turn his back on that, that would make God wrong because he said there would be a consequence. And so what, what the Bible says is, look, that, that this is a right state of affairs, that we are in this mess because of mankind's sin. We do sin. We do have this problem. And so it's right that we suffer from these things. Now, that's quite hard sometimes for us to bear as human beings. But that is the reality of what the Bible teaches. So we might ask this question, well, why does, doesn't God intervene? Like, why doesn't he make it all nice and rosy and cosy for mankind? Why? Well, he could do, right? So why doesn't he? And of course, God can do what he likes. He is sovereign and it is his purpose. And what, what I would say to you is, is that actually he has intervened and set in motion a purpose for the earth in his love and mercy, but perhaps in a way that, that humanly speaking, we might not fully appreciate unless we open the Bible and to understand, and as I say, add him to the conversation. Now, the purpose of God, when we open the Bible, um, the Christadelphians, we have a very distinctive understanding of this, which is quite different to mainstream Christianity. In fact, um, I might be as so bold as to say that we believe that, unfortunately, Christianity as a whole has completely lost sight of some of the key teachings of the Bible. That's why we encourage you to, to come and listen to, to some of the things we have to say, because we want to share our hope with you and, uh, and to re reconnect people, as it were, with, with the teaching of the Bible. And this is one of the key things, the, the, the God's purpose is with the earth. And we read in the Bible that, that God wants to fill the earth with his glory. And our understanding of that is that basically he wants to populate the earth eventually with immortal men and women who reflect his glory. They reflect his characteristics, his moral characteristics and his eternal physical nature. Like they, they will be completely changed from the mortal people that uh, they are today. And so eternal life is a part of that. And it's a part, primary part of God's purpose. We call it, as Christadelphians, God manifestation. Like he is going to clearly show himself in a multitude of people. It's quite a distinctive Christadelphian teaching. And we believe that's in the future. We believe that's going to happen in God's kingdom. And it's going to be a future age. And that today we are kind of in this, um, the, we're in the lead up to that future, those future events. So how is God going to accomplish his purpose with the earth? Well, we believe it's, um, it's through giving mortal people eternal life. Now, why would he do that? How could that be right? And um, what we find in the Bible is because he chooses those he wants. He presents to them the hope of the gospel, a, a, a message of salvation. And if they accept that and they believe it in faith, then he is willing in his love and mercy to give them divine nature, to forgive their sins and eventually to remove the problem of mortality and the temptation to sin when uh, in the future through the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is kind of how we see it. So most of mankind are on the left. They're in this natural state. We call it in Adam and that's how the Bible calls it and, and will end in death. But God in his mercy has intervened and he has chosen to call some people from all walks of life. He calls, he calls us mainly those that are humble and weak. The Bible says he doesn't work with the celebrities or many mighty and noble people. He works with the, uh, the, the, the weak things of the world. He, he chooses who he will. Maybe you're being called right now. And, and he calls them through the hope of his gospel. He, he allows them to have access to a knowledge of that. And if they accept it and are baptised, they become in Christ. And in that state of being in Christ, they have a special relationship with God. So even if they die, we believe that there will be a resurrection from the dead when Jesus returns in the future and this hope of eternal life is something that they very much can look forward to. So that's kind of how we understand it. Let's just uh, tick through some of those things. You know, this is what the Bible says. It says that um, Jesus, in fact, said this to his disciples. He says, go into all the world and preach 
the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And so this is the mechanism of salvation to be part of God's future kingdom. The Bible tells us very clearly that we have to believe the gospel and we have to act on it by associating ourselves with Jesus in baptism as a declaration of that faith. And then actually it goes on to explain we have to live lives of faith after that. That's what we we try and do as Christadelphians. And what we're actually doing here is that we're connecting ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is he so special? Well, he was, what we find is, is unlike what mainstream Christianity preaches, we find that the Bible tells us that he was a man like us. He had the same problem as us. He had the same problem of mortality and the temptation to sin. Yet, he was the only man in the whole of history who never sinned. He was, in fact, the son of God, and he was able to overcome the temptations of sin. And yet, even though he did all of that, he died as a sacrifice in obedience to God on the cross. And basically, what he was saying and what he declared, the Bible teaches us, is that God was right. Like even without transgressional sin, even without mankind actually committing a sin, the, the, the very nature, the very body, the very being that we are, whatever you want to call it, is worthy of destruction. And because it has inside it this mortality and these promptings to do things against God's will. And the Bible says to us, look, if you can accept that, if you can accept that mankind deserves death and that God is right, then on that basis, God is willing to also allow you to have the same things that happened to Jesus happen to you. And what happened to Jesus was because he had committed no sin, he was raised from the dead and given eternal life because he didn't deserve to, to stay in the grave, did he? Because he hadn't he hadn't actually himself personally transgressed God's law. And so God is saying, on the, for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of your faith in those things, he is willing to... Um, for you to be saved, if you adopt Christ as your representative, if you are baptised, if you connect with him. It's such a different message, isn't it, to that of mainstream Christianity, which kind of teaches that Jesus is a substitute, died instead of you. But that can't make sense, right? Because we still die and Jesus rose from the dead. So he kind of died instead of us. He died as a representative. He died to show us the way. He died in a way um, that declared that God was right. And the message of the Bible and the message of the gospel is, is, can you connect with that? Can you believe that? Do you believe in the rightness of God? And um, we see that this, this mechanism of the, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. That's how God saves people. He calls them to be saved. And um, it's life eternal to know God. And we read there that, not, that, that, that some are being called. For you see your calling, brethren, it says in Corinthians, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring them to naught. The things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's about his supreme um, sovereign will. It's not about us. It's not about the pride of man. It's about God. Now, we've got to therefore humble ourselves when we come to think about these things. We've got to really consider our position before before God. Now, that's not easy. That's not natural for us, but it's, it is the way of it. Now, the gospel message actually is, is far more complex um, than that in a way. It's simple, but there's more aspects to it, if we can call it that. Um, if you were interested in finding out more about the, the richness of the gospel message, um, perhaps I would suggest one thing that, um, well, first of all, um, that you you kind of consider that there's two parts to this. There's the things concerning the kingdom of God. That's that future kingdom that I've mentioned, which will come upon the earth. And there's the things about Jesus, which we've touched on already. And these two things have to be understood and believed before we can be baptized and commit. And if you um, if you've not heard of some of the things I've been talking about, then one thing that you could do is I think um, the Christadelphian statement of faith. You can get hold of online. We call it the Birmingham Amended Statement of Faith. 
And that really is a great summary of our understanding of the gospel, of these two parts to the gospel, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Um, it's a distinctive understanding of that gospel. And we believe it's so important to, to understand these things because, we, as we've read, the gospel is God's mechanism to salvation. So having a correct faith in these things is absolutely crucial. And it's through faith in that and baptism and a life of obedience, the Bible tells us that we can be reconciled to God and that, that this all happens and is centred in the Lord Jesus Christ. Reconciled means to be joined again, the restoration of a relationship. All through the Lord Jesus Christ, um, a man with the same problem as us, mortality and a temptation to sin. However, he never gave in. He died in obedience. And so because he did no sin, he was raised from the dead. And for his sake, as we've mentioned, God is willing to forgive our sin and willing to raise us from the dead and give us eternal life. God doesn't have to do that. God has intervened and it is in his love and mercy. But it is on his terms. Remember, mankind are the ones in the wrong. And we have to we have to follow, therefore, God's prescribed way forward in order to to um, to also take hold of his offer of eternal life in his grace and in his love and his mercy. So that's kind of how it works, look, you know, like through Adam's sin, we enter a state as a, as a race of sin and death. But through Christ and everything that it means in his sacrifice and his life, we can find reconciliation with God. Christ is the solution to mankind's problem. And, uh, and the kingdom is coming. Um, whereby God's purpose will be fulfilled. So we read of that, that as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And uh, we read of that future hope of having a change of nature, having a change from our mortality and the problems that we have in Philippians, for example, which says when Jesus returns, he will change believers' vile bodies that they might be fashioned like unto his glorious body and in Peter it tells us that that the hope of the Bible is to be a partaker of the divine nature and so that's what we as Christadelphians are waiting for we're waiting for Jesus to return and we're waiting um, for these things to take place for a resurrection of those that have died in hope and, uh, and have been accountable to the gospel for a there's a judgment seat um, where we will be judged to see whether we are we have indeed um obeyed the things and, and, and held true to the faith offered to us and in God's love and mercy the kingdom that will come after that where we will we hope and pray be made immortal in that coming age and the earth will be filled with the glory of God and this coming kingdom is very very clearly taught all the way through scripture um, it, it, in fact it, it existed in some small way in the past in, uh, in, in Chronicles and under the, the kings of David and Solomon, who were kings of, of Israel uh, in the past, we read that these, that these kings were, were kings on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord. And we read at the end of their dynasty in Ezekiel that the last king of, uh, of, their, of, the, of the series of kings was a king called Zedekiah. And the prophet Ezekiel is told to go to that king who was unfortunately wicked and tell him that that kingdom would be overturned and it would be no more until someone came whose right it was and it would be given to him. And that that him there is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who would come to sit on that throne eventually. We read of that in Luke. You might remember the, the story of the, uh, the, the birth of Jesus when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, Jesus's mother, and says to her that this this child that she was going to give birth to would be called the son of the highest and the Lord God would give unto him the throne of his father, David. And so Jesus, you see, he is, uh, he is going to be a king in that future kingdom. And the hope of the Bible is that that kingdom is going to be restored in a, in a greater way and that you and I can have a place in it. And so in Acts 1, we read after Christ's death and resurrection, he spends 40 days with his, with his followers. And uh, they ask him, after 40 days of spending time with Jesus, who's teaching them from the Bible, they ask him, Lord, wilt thou at this time 
restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he says, no, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. In other words, it's not at this time. I will restore it, but just not now. And in fact, you might remember the Lord's Prayer where he taught his followers to pray for the kingdom to come and for God's will to be done as it is in heaven. So this coming kingdom, this future on the earth is very much something that the Bible teaches as part of the good news, the gospel that we can have access through through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So just to sort of summarise, why doesn't God intervene? Well, he has intervened. He has already opened a way of salvation, a way of escape from sin and death through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's offered that through the gospel. And he calls us to that gospel to believe it and be baptised and to live a life of obedience. And he says that the gospel consists of two things, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So we've got to find out about those things. So I want to encourage you to find out the depth and the riches of those things. God is completely sovereign. And this is his way of escape. Now, just to sort of ask the final question, what is the purpose of the coronavirus then in all of this, of all of these things that we've been looking at? Well, could it be to further God's plan to establish his kingdom? And could it be to work on an individual level to cause people to reflect and draw close to him, to to cause you to reflect and me to reflect? Now, we've put could it be because... I can't tell you for sure. We don't have a direct revelation from God. As we've seen, pandemics and problems have been prevalent in the world all the way through history. But we believe God is in control and he has got a plan. And he works in a macro way, like with the kingdoms of men and the powers of this world and on a micro level with individuals. So we read in the macro here, like, for example, in, in Daniel 4, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. And giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. God is in sovereign control of the kingdoms and the powers of this earth. We might not always see it, you know. Like sometimes we, even as as believers, we we see things happen, and we we don't understand. We don't in, in the moment. We don't always know. And sometimes it seems counter in count. Like what is what what is God doing here? For example, um. You know, what God has done with the Jewish people down through the ages. You know, they were scattered in AD 70, if you know your history, from Jerusalem for their disbelief. But the Bible prophesied of their return before Jesus comes back to establish the kingdom I've been talking to you about. And um, it's remarkable when you when you look at their history because they were never not ready really to go back. In the 1800s, there was a chap called Theodore Herzl. He wanted he was Jewish. He wanted the Jews to go back to their land. But they they didn't want to. They weren't prepared to go back. And then, of course, we in history, we we, we find things like this, the Holocaust. And if we lived during the time of World War Two, we might think, why is this happening? Like like the Bible teaches that that God's got a purpose with the Jewish people, that he wants them back in their land. And it seems here that they're they're being punished and they're being massacred. And it was, of course, an absolutely horrific and terrible thing like how how could God's purpose be allow such a terrible thing with his special people and so we might have been confused like why is this happening we might not know but as time has gone on we can look back and we can think well what happened after World War II well the Jewish people needed a homeland didn't they and eventually that led to 1948 and for the state of Israel being declared and here's a picture of David Ben-Gurion the first Prime Minister of uh, of Israel declaring Israel as an independent state, fulfilling Bible prophecy. The Bible said the Jews would go back. And after 2000 years, the state of Israel was born and the Jews have flooded back ever since. Absolutely remarkable to think that uh, that the Bible said this was going to happen and that indeed it's happened. And so if we were living, though, at the time of World War Two, we might think, well, well, what was going on? We might not fully have appreciated the events that were occurring. But in fact, we can see that it was part of God's purpose to actually bring back Israel to their land. It was fulfilling a Bible prophecy. We can see that now with hindsight. But faith is would have been required at the time. And so that's a bit like now, like we don't quite know what's happening with the coronavirus, being completely honest. But we believe that God is in control. We have faith. And um, when the Bible 
uh, it actually gives a, a really interesting picture of the state of the nations just before Jesus returns. After the Jews have returned to the land of Israel. If you get time, have a look at Ezekiel 38. It's all about the latter days, a time period when the Jews will be back in their land after a period of dispersion. And so we believe this is our days. This is 1948 onwards. And the, the first few verses of the chapter talk about various nations by their ancient names that, that actually gather against Israel. Uh, and there's, there's, it's very interesting. It says they come against the mountains of Israel, which is the, air, I, the area of the West Bank. And what we're hearing on the news at the moment is major controversial things happening there as, as Israel um, uh, uh, saying they might annex the West Bank area, which could indeed bring down the nations upon them as prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel that would happen. And then God acts. And we believe this is when Jesus will, will, will appear on the earth in, in, very soon. Um, and in fact, in that prophecy, interestingly, just in passing, it says in verse 22 that, that when God acts and, and, and Jesus appears um, with um, his followers at that time, that, that this invading force will in fact be destroyed. And one of the ways it will be destroyed is with pestilence and with blood. So we wonder, like, is this coronavirus? Is this part of this? We, we do not know. But the Bible clearly teaches that will happen. The Bible speaks of Russia controlling Europe before Christ returns. Um, and uh, we wonder whether this, this crisis with the coronavirus will see that, that power shift happening. The Bible also talks about, we believe, our country of Britain. Uh, we believe it by the ancient name of Tarshish. And it's young, young lions. It's kind of colonies, as, as we would understand it, like America. It says that they're, they're separate from Europe. They're trading um, in the Gulf. Um, and they're, they're kind of weak because they're unable to, to resist this invading force of these other nations. And so we wonder, well, maybe this situation is helping to be accelerated by corona. Maybe this is part of God's plan. And in fact, interestingly, um, on the 13th of uh, July, um, there, was an there was an article issued by Newsweek that actually said that Russia had a, uh, in fact, the quote is, Russia coronavirus vaccine could be distributed next month. So apparently Russia is at the forefront of finding a solution to this problem. We wonder maybe this power struggle is, is part and parcel of the Bible's prophecies being fulfilled. But as we said, like God works on that macro level, he's bringing around the state of the nations. He's preparing them, as his prophets have said, to a particular point where the Lord Jesus Christ will return to save Israel from that invasion and to establish God's kingdom. That's how God has said things are going to play out. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because God does actually work with individuals, though. Um, it's not just kind of a, a, a an Old Testament thing, like the, the, this idea that, that the Old and New Testaments are complete, completely different. The New Testament talks about this as well, like that, that mankind is under this condemned state. It's interesting that people came to Jesus and um, there were these Galileans um, who had died. And um, this is what, what Jesus said about these, these unfortunate Galileans. He says, um, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So Pilate was a, a leader and had killed them. And so they suffered and they died. Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So the message that Jesus brings is, look, we're all going to perish. We are all going to die because we all sin. We might die by coronavirus. We might die by old age. We might die by cancer. We might get run over by a car. But the truth is that we, this is the state that we're in. We are going to die as, it, as we started with. We have to come to this awareness of death. But there's this idea of repentance, of changing our natural life, of doing things in the way that mankind would normally do and turning to God, changing. Repent means to turn around. And Jesus says, look, turn around, look at your own position. You've got to do this as an individual. I've got to do this as an individual. There's another example um, that a tower had fallen down in the time of Jesus, the Tower of Siloam. And, and after that, 
um, you know, people to t- talk to Jesus about it. And he says, well, do you think they were any worse than you are? Like, uh, were they worse than, than everybody else in Jerusalem? Jesus says, no. But what's the message? But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Same message. We are in this problem state. We are going to perish, but there is a way out. There is a way of escape. God works with individuals. He gives us an opportunity. Maybe he's calling you tonight. Maybe he's calling me. And once we are, you know, life isn't supposed to be um, a load of uh, a load of sweeties and comfort. You know, we read of that all the way through the Bible. In fact, it says that God corrects those that he loves. He causes problems, evil circumstances to come into our lives to help us, to change us, to help us rely on him, to help us to realize that we aren't, um, you know, we aren't supreme, that he is supreme, that we need to rely on him. And so we have this, this, this verse here, for example, my son despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. And so if God is calling an individual, he sees something in them, he wants them in his kingdom. We have this comfort that in fact even if we struggle even if we caught coronavirus even in fact if we died God might be teaching us something in these things because it's about the future it's not about now in fact James tells us to be joyful when we have various diverse temptations or trials because we know that God will be working in us and so as a Christadelphian response you know we we really do believe this verse here, that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you have a faith in God, if you believe that you understand the gospel, that you've been called to that, that you've committed yourself to that, and you have a true understanding of that gospel, and you're striving as best as you can, God, it says here, will work for good, even in the the, the negative circumstances of life. And so we sum up then here, What's the purpose of the coronavirus? We can't definitively say, but perhaps it's to further God's purpose in the establishment of his kingdom on a macro level. And at the same time, God can work in multiple uh, sort of work streams, as it were. At the same time, he's working on a personal level to those he wishes to call to him. This is what we believe that the, the purpose of the coronavirus will be. Because ultimately, God is bringing us all to his grand purpose That one day he will be king over all the earth and there will be one Lord and his name one. And we believe that ultimately in that day, things will have changed for mankind and for those followers who have been faithful. That God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things, says the Bible, are passed away. And so that's the hope, that's the solution centred in the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of the Christadelphians, the hope of the gospel that we've been privileged to sort of share with you today. And so our message to you is simple. Find out about the gospel, build up your faith. We hope that you will join us again. Another, uh, we, we have lectures that, um, that we give on our Zoom account. We hope we'll be able to connect with you. We do various things like seminars. But we really want to share with you our faith. We really want to um, to lead people to the message of the Bible and the great hope that we believe we've discovered in it, which, as we've said, is quite distinctive and different, perhaps, to, to what other people are teaching. And so I hope you found it interesting. I hope that's given you a perspective, a Christadelphian response. And we're really excited then to to listen to your to your questions, if you've got any. And um, And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, that was a very clear and, and straightforward presentation about the uh, the reasons why suffering is part of the world and part of our lives and how it is all part of God's loving plan and we are in his loving hands. Um, and it's part of his plan and purpose to restore that breach and that divide that you mentioned between humans and God. Um, and then the reason I think it was a very clear and straightforward presentation is I don't think we've had any live questions raised uh, during the presentation. Everyone was captivated by your words. 
Uh, so we'll take that as a good sign. Um, however, if you are still watching and you do have a question, there is still time, so please use the Q&A panel to drop that uh, on the chat now. Um, however, in the build-up to this evening's webinar, we did have a number of questions asked via Facebook. Um, and so before I uh, before we finish, I think it'd be good if we can try and address one of those or, or two of those. Um, you mentioned about early on about God being a God of love. Um, and so that's also related to another question we had on Facebook about the possibility of the devil uh, as well. So if you equate God to being a God of love, how do you equate that with the idea of him being in control of suffering? Isn't it the devil that causes suffering? I think that's a good question. So let me take let me take that sort of one at a time if I can. So first of all, is God a God of love? A hundred percent yes. Like every Christadelphian you never meet, anybody who really understands their Bible will understand that God is a God of love. Now, that doesn't mean to say, well, in fact, it says that, doesn't it? I, I, I think I've got it. Um, 1 John 4 verse 8 says, God is love, right? But, but I think sometimes what we think, Matt, is that... Um, it's going to be confusing, is it? Because we're both called Matt. So, you know, anyway, bear with us. Um, one, one of the things I think some people seem to think is that, well, look, um, if God is a God of love, then he should show love to me. And this is what I require of him to do X, Y and Z. Right. And if he's not that, then he's not showing me any love. And I think that is to to completely misunderstand the message of the Bible, because the God of the Bible is a God of mercy. Yes. And love but also a God of truth and a God of, of rightness and righteousness. And so to, to, to enter into God's love, we have to actually kind of listen to him. It's like what I said at the start of the presentation. We have to um, open up our minds to his voice in the conversation. They're not just us saying, this is what we want. This is what we expect. And the way that we open up the conversation to, so that we can listen to God is is to open up the Bible. And that requires humility, time, effort. We have to roll up our sleeves. We have to do the work. We have to try and understand these things because they don't come naturally to us. But when we do that, that's when we uncover this, um, this message of the gospel. And in fact, we suddenly realize once we understand the gospel, wow, God has and is a God of love. And he has opened this way of escape for us if only we can approach unto him in the way that he's prescribed. And that's what it's about, really, I think, uh, uh, Matt. It's about um, us having that humility, which is very hard for us all to do. So first point, first part, yes, God is the God of love. The question about the devil, though, is very, very interesting. Um, we pointed out in the presentation, didn't we, that the Bible explains that God is supreme, okay? Remember that verse, it said... Um, I will do all my pleasure, right? So God can do all his pleasure. Now, I have a challenge for those that that, uh, that that perhaps in mainstream Christianity that put forward this concept of a devil. And that is, is how can God be in supreme control and yet at the same time um, have, um, you know, have allowed some supernatural fallen angel devil to run around thwarting his plan right it doesn't seem to quite add up so there's a there's a problem here um and it's definitely worth thinking about now as christadelphians i can't go into obviously it's not our subject tonight the devil we we, we speak about the devil uh, a, a lot um from our from our lectures which obviously we're we're doing virtually at the moment but um you'll find a lot of material online about, about our understanding of, of the devil. Just very quickly, just a couple of things. If you look at the actual meaning of the word devil, it means slanderer or liar. And the same with the word Satan, that has another meaning. It simply means adversary. And as Christelphians, what we believe is you have to look at the context of what's being said. Often we find that mainstream Christianity and theologians, they will read into the text that they that the devil is this immortal fallen angel or that this Satan is some sort of demon. But the truth is, is if you just read them as slanderer or adversary, then suddenly it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, and there are many passages which we could take as an example to show that. So um, actually, I don't know if um, 
if we've got time. But, um, I, I, quite, I would quite like to turn to two passages, if that's all right. If we flick over quickly to Isaiah 14, I'm just going to give you an example of how we can easily read into the text. Um, perhaps something that might not be there at all. But because we come to the text with this view that, you know, the problem is with the devil, suddenly we read that into the text. So in Isaiah 14, we have the classic, um, I guess you'd call it the Lucifer passages, right? Which, um, which is mentioned in verse 12, where we read, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And um, without going into a full exposition of this passage, it's often put forward that this must be an immortal fallen angel called Lucifer who's fallen down from heaven, right? And you read that verse in isolation, you think, yeah, that probably sounds, sounds like it might be that. But if you look earlier in the chapter, you'll find it's nothing of the sort. Um, it's, uh, it says there in verse four that well, who's this prophecy for? Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say. So this Lucifer isn't some immortal fallen angel. It's the king of Babylon who was up high in the heavens, as it were, of, of rulership. And it's talking metaphorically about him being brought down and humbled. And we can tell it's a man like the king of Babylon, because in verse 16, it says it calls him a man. It says they that see thee, Lucifer, shall narrowly look down upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? And we could go on. We could give you loads of examples. But the point here is you can't just take one verse out of is in isolation, apply a, a thought that this must be an immortal fallen angel devil and then say job done. We as Christadelphians believe that when we that when we look at the context of some of these passages that talk of a devil or a Satan or something like that, there's a much better explanation. And the truth is, is that the problem is, is with us as human beings and we can't resolve uh, and, and step away from our responsibility to the problem of sin and death, which is affecting us as a, as a race. One final passage. Can we just quickly for, turn over to Hebrews chapter two? I just uh, put this forward as a, as a as a kind of a an interesting thought in relation to this idea of an immortal fallen angel devil which as i say as christadelphians we don't accept as being a concept in scripture um when look looking at the context but if you look at um, hebrews 2 and verse 14 it's talking about the work of the lord jesus christ and interestingly it says there for as much as the children or the children of mankind, if you like, are partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So the Bible does mention a devil. And um, oftentimes we believe that it is. Um, that it that, that it actually refers to something which is personified. In other words, it's a it's a concept which is talked about as if it's a person. And this is the same. There's loads of examples of this in the Bible. Like wisdom is personified as a woman, for example. Um, it talks of wisdom as if it's a woman. It, uh, we believe here this devil is being spoken of like it's a person, but it isn't. Now let me just uh, let me just sort of pick that apart just very quickly. Ask yourself this question: Why is it? that Jesus Christ had to become a partaker of flesh and blood, like mortal um, flesh and blood, like with its, all its problems that like we've explained. Why did he have to become a weak mortal person in order to destroy the devil if this is an immortal fallen angel devil? And not only that, note this, that Jesus has destroyed the devil, it says there. OK, so he has he, he, he has destroyed him that has the power of death. So how did that happen by Jesus being a weak, mortal man? So there must be another explanation. There must be another understanding. And and just very simply, although we haven't got time to go all through it, we understand that this verse is talking about the problem of of sin and the temptations of sin, which is the devil in this passage. It's it's a personification of of sin. Um, remember, the devil simply means a slanderer. You know, so so that's what sin does. It, it 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 lies to us and it makes us think something. So I hope that's kind of, um, you know, basically um, touched on that. The problem is with man, not some devil. 
we have to take responsibility. And um, the Bible clearly shows that. We showed some passages. Sin which dwelleth in me, Paul said in Romans 7. And uh, remember in James, it says that man is drawn away of his own lust. Yeah. It's not that we can put the blame on, on the devil, folks. We are the problem. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Matt. Um, so we have had a, a question whilst you were answering that question, uh, if you're able to follow up on that. Yeah. So um, I think it leads on from what we we're talking about, um, the fallen world, which you presented earlier on. So there were two elements. One was the the world itself and also it was as individually. And the question off the floor has come, uh, what will the world look like post-resurrection? So but while you're quickly thinking of an answer, uh, one thing that jumped into my mind was uh, a verse in Isaiah chapter 2, which tells us uh, about the period of the kingdom where it says that they shall beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks and nations will not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. So that's relating to um, the mankind's relationship with each other, but it signals that after the resurrection, there may be a, a world of peace. Mm. So... It's probably worth worth mentioning here that our understanding as Christadelphians of the kingdom age is that um, it mentions in Revelation that it, it will last a thousand years, right? So there's a period of time, a thousand years after Jesus returns. And then at the end of that, the whole world will be full of immortal people. And so there's a sort of an interim millennial period where the followers of Jesus during this time that we're living in now, who've been baptized and connected with him and, and done their best to follow him and who are accepted upon his return at the resurrection of the judgment to be with him. We read that they will reign as kings and priests for a thousand years at that time. And they will be reigning over the rest of the mortal population of the earth who will also be given an opportunity at that point to submit to Jesus and to and to and to be saved, um, so they then live out their lives as as mortal beings in this blessed era that you've talked about of this peaceful and safe existence. In fact, there's other passages that talk about that. There's also a righteous system of judgment that will take place, and and Christ and the saints who will be ruling then with with Jesus, the followers of Jesus um, in the kingdom, they will be helping to to kind of be due leaders of, if you like. Um, it talks in Isaiah about long life and good health, uh, like a child will die, I think it says, of 100 years old or something. So so lifespans increase. And it talks about the earth being full of, um, like the fruits of the earth being more abundant. There's going to be handfuls of corn on the top of mountains, for example, it mentions. So the earth is kind of healed. So it starts to go back, as it were, to the blessed state it was in before the fall and there's other examples like um i think there's a a passage about um uh, is it about a lamb sitting down with wolves and stuff like this so there seems to be a change in the animal kingdom as well we don't know all the details but the pictures we are given is a, a picture of bliss and a, and a really beautiful time of peace for the world under this rulership of christ and the saints so i think that, that hopefully that gives a bit of a a bit of a picture at the end of a thousand years those mortal people that have died we read that there'll be another resurrection and judgment and at the end of that all of those accepted will be immortalized and fill the earth and that's what i really think that passage that we started our talk with about the earth being filled with the glory of god will be complete in in corinthians i think it's 1 corinthians 15 it says god will be all in all in other words the whole population of the earth will be reflecting and manifesting God's character and his nature as immortal human beings. So that's that for us is the hope of the Bible. And um, that's what we're really excited about as we see the signs of the times and these events that we mentioned about in the world starting to, to bring uh, to bring about the situation God's prophets spoke about that will take place just before Jesus returns. We're right there on the cusp. And that's why we're, we're super keen to share our message with people. Okay, thank you again. Um, so with the in the absence of any further questions, I think we'll start to draw things to a close now. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for leading that webinar for us. My uh, absolute pleasure. Also, and thank you, everybody, for, for, for joining. And if you're watching afterwards, thank you. You know, yeah. do, do, do get in touch with us if you need anything. Yeah, that's right. Um, in ordinary times, we would normally meet in our hall on a Sunday afternoon. Um, 
and we would love to invite you to come and join us for our Bible lecture. Um, but obviously we can't do that at the moment. Um, so whilst we wait for that to become possible again, we'd like to bring to your attention the resources on our website. Um, we do post a weekly Bible lecture there on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so please visit that website to keep in touch. And there are also recordings from previous weeks on there. So there's plenty already to watch. Um, I've just checked and there was a lecture posted on May the 14th uh, on the subject of the devil and Satan. And if I just show you what the page looks like, so you can click on uh, the page to view the Bible talks and you'll be able to view all of the, the talks that are listed there. So please go and make use of those. We can also support you with any Bible study um, that you would like to continue to do yourself. We have a Bible reading planner, which has some handy reading notes to get you started in the first week. And you can then drop us an email or a message via the website if you'd like to receive some reading notes for week two onwards by email. And we can also run online seminars and a correspondence course. Uh, so please do get in touch with us if you have any more information. So thanks once again for joining us this evening and we hope to see you again in the future for another event. Although we can't guarantee there'll be two bearded mats from Nottingham presenting that time. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you again soon.